Welcome to January Innovation Connect, uh, hosted by the Department of the Air Force Chief Data Office. Um, many of you attended our event in November. We had Softworks presenting then, and we had um, our very own Department of the Air Force, Dr. Stockton, presenting on the condition-based maintenance projects. Um, we, we had to take off in December for the holidays, but we're back in January. We're very excited. Um, Today, we're going to have two really great speakers. The first one is Presidential Innovation Fellow and the founder of uh, the Department of the Navy's Black Pearl Project, Mr. Ken Cato. Our second speaker will be the Chief Software Officer of the Department of the Air Force, Mr. Nicholas Chalon, and he will be here to speak about DOD Platform 1. Um, I'm Callie King. I am with the uh, Department of the Air Force Chief Data Office, and um, we are excited about continuing these events on a monthly basis. Um, if anyone in the audience has any ideas or projects they'd like to see highlighted here, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, you're welcome to reach out to myself or anyone on my team. Um, we have Ty Daniels and Lindsay Mask also online today, and so you could reach out to any of the three of us on um, Teams or via email. And we'll put some emails up at the end of the, the session as well. Um, so Innovation Connect, it's an event that we host across DOD. Uh, the, the focus is to cross-pollinate ideas and build an innovation community here um, and get some really cool projects highlighted um, in the Department of the Defense that are happening right now. Um, to get started, I would like to share a few housekeeping rules. Um, first off, thank you all for joining today. This is being recorded. Um, if you're not a presenter, we ask that you please keep your phone on mute and or your, your microphone on mute and keep your video off to help us conserve bandwidth. Um, our speakers today are going to be giving an overview of their topics and it'll be followed by a Q&A session. Um, throughout the presentation, we encourage you to use uh, the chat feature down in the bottom corner to ask any questions that you have. Uh, we'll read the questions out after the speakers have given their presentation. And we'd also like you to keep questions and topics presented um, and refrain from any media-related questions. Uh, please don't bring up your company or advertise your company or organization or talk about um, business that can be taken off, uh, off of this presentation. These are just technical questions that we're having here today. Um, we will read the questions out loud at, after the presentations are over and have kind of a panel discussion. So it's now my pleasure to introduce our first speaker. Uh, Mr. Ken Cato is an entrepreneur, platform cloud architect, change agent, and innovator with a wide range of experience across highly regulated industries, including finance, healthcare, and defense. Um, as a founding member of Kessel Run, which is uh, one of the Air Force's software uh, operations, uh, Mr. Cato disrupted U.S. Air Force technology uh, to provide a cloud platform and help begin their cloud native journey. Uh, Mr. Cato continues to iterate on concepts focusing on Internet of Things sensor data, aggregation, and predictive analysis. Um, he also works with security across software and platform lifecycle and edge computing at the extremes of information availability. Uh, Mr. Cato has a passion to keep pursuing ideas from theory to maturation. And between experience and data, Mr. Cato predicts how decisions made today will be survivable for years ahead and strives to develop a sustainable strategy for organizational growth. Uh, Mr. Cato, we're very excited to have you speaking today, and the floor is now yours. Uh, so first of all, thank you so much for the amazing kind intro, and uh, hello, to, and nice to meet many of you have not met before, and to some of you I've seen very familiar faces, nice to see you again. I'm very thrilled to be here and talk to you all about what I am doing as a Presidential Innovation Fellow in the Department of Navy, namely Black Pearl. So let me share my screen with you. Can folks see my screen now? I can't see anybody, so is that a yes? Yes, sir, we can see it. Great. So let me get started and uh, have to take questions after this one as well. So uh, we began Black Pearl as a journey to figure out, can we really stand up a platform or software practice quickly in the Department of the Navy? 
And that's the story I want to talk to you about today. So there's a lot of mis- you know, kind of misconception of what we are. Uh, we are in software practice. And when we say that, we want to specifically delineate we are not a software factory. Defining difference is this. Um, we are not beholden to a single program in the Department of Navy to write software to a specific warfighting component. Instead, we are a software practice where we contribute our expertise. We're all industry folks who are just like us, practitioners and agilists to help enable different teams across the Department of Navy to become their own software factory. So there's a lot of problems, and I feel that the problem statement I captured isn't unique to the Department of Navy. I feel that this is a journey that had a very similar journey in the Air Force as well. So there's a hundred of free efforts across the Naval Enterprise that's doing research, and that's fine, but they're trying to reinvent the basics of DevSecOps infrastructure. The problem that that becomes is that as these folks keep doing that and the knowledge gathering is great, it takes away time and resources on what those folks should be doing is delivering mission capability. And it's on a constant cycle like this because most of the teams don't have the core competency and, you know, agile, lean, depth spec ops to truly understand what the cultural change, not even the tech stack, is about. And this creates a lack of commonality when no one talks to one another. So we now have a lack of commonality in this tech stack, which opinions change, but we also have a lack of opinion and commonality in several organizations. And this just distorts any economy of scale, even if it goes to a cloud name runtime. So the unavailability of these kind of high quality environments is slowing down transformation more than they are aiding and really hampering what, you know, the any kind of rapid capability development that the Department of Navy writ large that folks in the DOD should be doing. So the vision is for us as the acceleration team. So again, we're a software practice here where we are helping different naval platform teams come to us for different help, be it platform help, uh, help with the culture adoption, coaching on Agile. We just teamed up with Naval X. So Naval X is our Agile coaching partner in a lot of those respects. And we have Lighthouse, who is our internal team that does the baseline development. And the baseline development is that platform that we require to actually have that conversation. We recognize it's really hard to teach teams to go fast and enable them without a quality platform to do so. So we create that platform based on open source technologies. And in the beginning, we'll, we had the litmus test. So can we go fast? We spoke to Vice Admiral Moran and said that, you know, we should be able to get this done in 100 days. We got it done 25 days under our goal in 75 days, ready to launch. So the value position. So we want to reduce the time and money spent by different folks on the basics of the infrastructure. And if we are having folks spend two to three million bucks a year on researching and trying to pull out the software factory, we can reduce many of those means and time of burden by providing a no license cost open source infrastructure that you can just take go on. We can also increase the quality and the ability of these environments because we're folks who've done it in the live and living industry. And we also have worked in the defense industry long enough to know what it takes to create a secure platform. And that drives towards what we really want to go after is that mission success the outcome of the continuous ATO where we're going to be able to buy a contiguous and continuous platform where we have parity between dev and prod so that when you go to you know, push your app out, it's the same experience no matter what. And we want to be able to provide that mentorship that's really, really necessary to grow the workforce. So we recognize that we're not going to be able to do everything for everybody. And again, our job is software practice. We're here to enable people. And I said this on our AMA time and time again, that the metric of success of Black Pearl is that we no longer exist. We are here to teach DevOps and DevSecOps. We don't feel that that is a forever thing. So product offerings, let's talk about that. So we have Party Barge, which is our shared development environment built on the Lighthouse platform. So this is maintained by us. We're the opinion on the ATO, the different DSOP components, the tool chain that we built up for you, uh, inspecting deep packets on, you know, different communications or even down to the libraries you use on your development. That so we have an entire stack ready to look at that stuff. Lighthouse is that pause baseline. Here's the stuff we offer on the open source basis of what we have 
that would help you get a secure, good running platform that's based on modern current runtimes that's not outdated. So we can offer high security environments with very low cost and software practice. So we're staff by industrial professionals who've done it time and time again for many, many years. We're here to help educate your team so your team can grow and take on and keep taking on leadership force and also to start providing those necessary capabilities to warfighters. So our mission focus is really, really simple. It's that common problem stuff that we're kind of going after. We know uh, Jane Rathbun, the Department of Navy CEO, says very famously, build once, deploy everywhere. So what we want to recognize is there's a lot of folks, you know, programs, projects, people who are focused on mission capabilities because they're trying to come up with the soft environment. The large proportion of resources are wasted on reinventing a DSOP. And that all slows down the delivery mission value. I would even go as far as say it dilutes any mission value. So we want to be able to pivot your mission's value up the value stream. We want to be able to provide the 80% common infrastructure underneath so that you can have the same baseline of short of flow in the cloud and be able to develop and expect to be able to deploy in any environment. That enables programs to focus on customizing stuff that won't find demand and moving their PEOs programs and projects further up that value stream so that they can continue to just reuse the environment, the 80% hard, so they can contribute the really valuable 20% like mission critical value. And at the end, you know, Warfighter gets to ask me faster compared to what and how we do software and software delivery in the Department of Navy. So we also focus having a security because we're the Department of Defense. We recognize that the government at large faces uh, every piece of problem with cybersecurity with many disclosures occurring today. And APO today are done on RMF, which is heavily compliance based. And the compliance doesn't necessarily answer security. And there is a lot of misconception and ambiguity around cloud native applications, cloud native environments. So without the expertise and knowledge then, there's a need to be able to do this well, the APR process, and more importantly, how to adjudicate secure environments. So what we propose is the compliant hardened and hardened platform, and the way we do the compliant and hardened portion, we have adversarial testing that we feel go way above and beyond that of traditional RMF components. We reduce the cyber footprint significantly by having that 80% common infrastructure repeat you know, rents, right? So rents repeat, rather, where, as Jane said, build once, deploy many. So we want to be able to have that deploy many and have any security patches fixed way faster than traditional control and change management. And we also have really designed an environment with query hints in mind. So this is this was my lessons learned coming at Castle Run about how we thought about RMF and RMF controls and how different CSPs think about the shared responsibility and applying that thought to the inheritance of RMF controls. So with that, we free up a lot of cyber resources. And so they can start focusing on advanced security engineering, meaning that we want to start working with different teams, be it Scott, AO's office, and different security red teams to start thinking about how to do adversary testing on cloud native environments. And all this is really largely possible because of our joint operation with Platform One. So uh, Nick Chillon, speaking uh, today as well, and I have an agreement in place where we jointly collaborate, and we're very excited to be the first uniform service to participate and collaboratively develop the same baseline with Platform One. So we share that platform collaboration. We share Repo One. We also share Iron Bank. And then we manage our different areas of interest. So Platform One, largely services the Department of Air Force and much other parts of the Department of Defense where we are hyper-focused on being the Naval Enterprise Resource. We look at the United States Navy and the Marine Corps. So we bring the goodness of the Naval side and understanding of security and what we need to do for different areas that the, the, I think the Air Force may not traditionally have, and we now have a joint bigger team to go after those big chunk problems that everyone's going to face. So this also gives that economy of scale where instead of having two different teams doing two different things, we're now having a conjoint collaboration and contribute the same baseline, providing the same security improvements to both. So interest commonality is what we're going after for the Lighthouse platform. Again, we have the 8% hard, 
So you can concentrate on the 20% value add to your warfighter. So our working model is to be able to provide that lighthouse platform, that baseline, for us to pay party barge and cloud environments. We also can take lighthouse and pay that to on-prem infra and to other infrastructure to pay different software factories and specific deployments. Uh, the example here uh, would be leveraging the uh, digital warfare offices, uh, digital warfighting platform, which is an own small ball factor uh, quickly on a ship kind of deal, where we can pull on the lighthouse baseline and they can put their factories on top to develop or to deploy forward to have a mission platform. Similarly, project, uh, and for Project Blue is what they did as well. They have their cloud development environment, and the next thing we're iterating on is how to deliver to team subs. So deploy everywhere is something we said time and time again so far. So to recap, Lighthouse, we service the basis of the different mission platforms, as well as the cloud platforms and depth platforms. Uh, Party bars, it's that shared DSOP that helps things go fast. And mission applications are those that you, the customers, bring to us and we can help develop and stand up your team and also help with the accreditation. So there's a lot of stuff that we do in our platform to ease the accreditation package. We're totally willing and looking forward to working with your team on that front as well. So proliferation, there's some stuff in DevSecOps that we feel are critical that are commonly misunderstood. DevSecOps, as I say quite frequently, is a culture, not something you buy or a piece of technology you leverage. The first thing we teach is that culture change and how necessary it is to have for teams to really successfully adopt not only DevSecOps, but to pivot to Azure and Lean Management. And one of the things we do is that we believe in the release pattern. I do, we do, you do. We don't expect for you to come to us, give you a bunch of books to read, and be on your own. We're going to work with you side by side. You're going to watch us do it. We're going to do it with you. And then we're going to watch you do it. And then we're going to walk away. We're going to pivot to the next program, next program, next program. And Mr. Valley Focus. So we're looking to leverage through uh, lean prospect needs, much like value stream mapping, to understand the importance of mission value, where we can also help different teams better align their mission resources to what has the highest value they can offer. So please connect with us. I know that this is a whole lot of slides, and we're doing a lot of meetings. And again, thank you all for being here. I know that it's kind of overloaded times. And let's face it, this is Slideware, so please reach out. We're happy to demo and all that fun jazz. Any questions? Uh, thank you. Now we're going to have that right after Mr. Shillon presents, and we'll do a panel discussion with both of you. So uh, we appreciate that. And next up, we do have the Chief Software Officer, Mr. Nicholas Shillon. Uh, Mr. Shalon was appointed as the first Air Force Chief Software Officer in May of 2018. Uh, he's also co-lead for the Department of the Defense Enterprise DevSecOps Initiative um, with the Department of Defense Chief Information Officer. Uh, as the Air Force's senior software czar, Mr. Shalon is responsible for enabling Air Force programs in the transition to Agile and DevSecOps to establish force-wide DevSecOps capabilities and best practices. Um, including continuous authority to operate processes and faster streamlined technology adoption. Um, in addition to his public service, Mr. Shalon is also a technology entrepreneur, a software developer, a cyber expert, and an inventor. He has over 19 years of domestic and international experience with strong technical and subject matter expertise in cybersecurity, software development, product innovation, governance, risk management, and compliance. Uh, specifically, these fields include cloud computing, um, Cybersecurity, DevSecOps, big data, multi-touch, mobile, um, Internet of Things, mixed reality, virtual reality, and wearables. Mr. Shalon is recognized as one of France's youngest entrepreneurs and as a pioneer of the computer language PHP. He is sought-after advisor and speaker and participates in multiple industry conferences and experience working in close collaboration with many Fortune 100 companies and the U.S. government. We are very excited today to have Mr. Shalon. Uh, sir, the floor is yours. You may have to unmute yourself. Hey, sorry. Th thank you. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much for the, the presentation. It sounds way more fancy than I am, but uh, I appreciate it. 
Um, wanted to give a, a little bit of time today to cover uh, some of the key pieces of what we built. And first, I wanted to uh, obviously thank the uh, Chief uh, Data Officer Office for organizing this uh, great event. Uh, obviously, we have a great partnership with the CDO. But I also wanted to uh, thank my friend here, uh, Ken, that has been uh, sharing some of his journey at the Navy. And he's been able to do so much in just such a short amount of time. And um, what's exciting here is is, uh, is putting egos aside and looking at the best interests of the department uh, by partnering with Platform One and, and the Air Force. Um, so we can have the same stack, we can build faster, stronger, better things together as a team. And that's very exciting to see. Uh, that's a good lesson to learn for a lot of people out there. Um, so first, uh, a quick, uh, quick uh, rundown on the uh, some of the content uh, that you can go and uh, take a look at on the software that we have. The new website we have all of the recordings, videos, documents, and training content that we put together, uh, including a lot of the links and access to our uh, architecture uh, documents, uh, all the containers we uh, provide, and all of the services and access to GitLab repos and all of the cool stuff we do. So please check it out. Uh, that's always a great source of content. That's why we also announced our uh, Ask Me Anything event. Uh, so if you want to join and ask more questions, we do those every every three weeks. So uh, that's also a great way to learn more. We That's why we talked about the Confuse ATO, and there's so many things I won't have the time really today in 30 minutes uh, to try to cover all, all of that. But uh, we'll try to at least give you a, a lot of excitement, uh, and so you can see what's coming and what's already available uh, to uh, the DoD today. Um, so, what is the DoD Enterprise DevSecOps Initiative? It's, uh, it's a joint team between ANS, DoD CIO, the Air Force, and all of the services. With this, uh, uh, we are building enterprise IT uh, capabilities uh, that brings timeliness and modularity and enabling reuse. Uh, Cloud One and Platform One is uh, are two of the foundations of that stack. Cloud One is a cloud office that gives access to Amazon and Azure, uh, but also um, to uh, C2S, the IC Cloud, and Fences, the Stack Cloud. And Platform One is a DevSecOps team, a software factory team that can be instantiated anywhere on premise, on cloud provider, classified clouds, it doesn't matter. Uh, the goal is to make sure we're not getting locked into a single product or a single stack or cloud provider. And so we're using uh, Kubernetes and containers. We'll talk about that. Reusable Lego blocks that can let us build uh, capabilities uh, on demand uh, anywhere uh, at any time without uh, being uh, locked into a single product. Um, we are also bringing managed services when it comes to DevSecOps with collaboration tools, development tools, cyber tools, uh, zero engineering and modeling uh, simulation tools, on uh, Platform One at multiple classification levels in partnership with Cloud One. Uh, so you're going to see we have a lot of great um, capabilities running, ready to go for teams to consume. Um, we are also hardening and accrediting open source and commercial products with all, over 300 products already hardened on Iron Bank, which is a central repo for DoD for containers. Other great example. Uh, with Ken partnering on the Iron Bank with us so we can uh, do more uh, with the Navy as a team instead of every uh, team uh, re-scanning, hardening uh, commercial and open source projects. Um, everything we do is based on zero trust, and so we are using uh, behavior detection and zero trust of the container level. We'll talk a little bit about that. We are also the provider of the Jake, the joint AI center uh, with OSD for AI machine learning, deep learning, managed services. And like I said, we also provide uh, the digital engineering platform as a service uh, that's going to be renamed to something one. We have to pick another one name uh, because we don't have enough. Um, yeah. So that's coming as well. Uh, and we have to train about 100,000 people this year. So we are bringing state-of-the-art uh, DevSecOps curriculum with unbiased content coming from uh, industry, uh, with partnership with the Linux Foundation, the Coordinated Computing Foundation, and um, O'Reilly Box uh, to provide access to uh, content, but also to a cloud sandbox to learn uh, by doing. Um, and then, of course, I'm also the chair of the DSOG uh, DevSecOps team that 
bringing together a lot of great uh, new um, uh, principles around the fake ops and continuous authority to operate CATO. Uh, one of the time to cover much about it, but, but effectively it enables us to release software multiple times a day as needed, as often as needed, ready, uh, and automating a lot of the software lifecycle uh, scanning and testing. And we have engagements with embedded systems uh, tying back to OT, DT, nuclear authority, and uh, um, uh, air worldiness as well. All right. Um, some of the, the key thing that you know, sometimes uh, people miss, and I assume you can see my, my screen. I'm just uh, assuming that I'll take that as a yes. If anyone on the chat can just say yes. Yes, we screen. can. All right. <laughs> cool. Uh, I was afraid for a second. Um, so uh, why does all of this matter? Uh, I can tell you it's just first uh, no way to build software in 2021 now uh, at the scale that we need and the moving at the pace of relevance without that stack up. It's just uh, not going to happen. Uh, so obviously, timeliness is foundational for both cybersecurity and to be able to compete. So fail fast, learn fast, don't fail twice for the same reason. Of course, we cannot be left behind uh, our adversaries, and uh, we have already saved in one year a hundred year of plan time uh, thanks to Compute ATO, which saves about twelve to eighteen months of plan time uh, for every program per five years of time. And then thanks to the continuous feedback loop between the end user and the program office, which saves about 12, uh, 12 to 12 months of time for every program per five years uh, of time as well. So massive, massive uh, time saving. Uh, if the time saving wasn't good enough, uh, we also save on average 12 and a half million per year uh, per ACAT1 software intensive programs as well. Um, of course, we enable that fast feedback loop to bring uh, capabilities to production very fast and get the, the feedback we need to improve or redirect or realign based on demands or needs or based on new things happening uh, in the world. That could be cybersecurity events. That could be uh, new technologies uh, coming to life. And you don't want to be stuck in time. And so um, uh, the additional benefit, of course, of the continuous ATO is that reciprocity across the department, across all classification levels, all the way to staff. Uh, effectively, we're creating these Lego blocks, uh, containers that can be reused across programs, across teams. And by bringing that GFP uh, DevSecOps environment to uh, program office and their primes and, and subs or any startups, effectively, we are uh, limiting the uh, complexity to uh, be compliant with our uh, cyber requirements and things like that. Um, of course, we also bring hardware loop uh, testing uh, and continuous testing at the edge because we can deploy the, the DevSecOps stack anywhere at any time. Um, some numbers, you know, in case none of this was enough, uh, then I don't know what else you need. Maybe those numbers to convince you. Um, and so, obviously, faster mission delivery, 106 times faster lead time from dev to prod, 208 times more frequent code deployments, uh, seven times less uh, failure, 22% uh, more less time spent on uh, rework or unplanned work, uh, 50 times less time spent on uh, remediating uh, cyber issues after the fact, um, 2,600 times uh, faster recovery. Uh, we call that me time to recover. So if you have a bug, how quickly or, or problems, how quickly can you uh, get back uh, to normal? Um, development costs are reduced by 40% on average. So you, you end up doing more for the same amount of money, effectively. Um, Faster prototyping uh, creates that 44% uh, more time is focused on a new capability versus maintaining the legacy code. And, oh, if it wasn't enough, because we care, obviously, about uh, morale and our people, we, um, we see that employees are 2.2 times more likely to recommend their organization if you're um, using a DevSecOps and the latest uh, and the brightest technologies are there. So that's exciting. Um, so when I, I look at the ecosystem, right, um, we have a platform in Cloud One, obviously partnering. And we're gonna we're gonna need to add our friends of Black Pearl here, uh, working with us hand in hand to bring this to the Navy. 
Um, but this is really kind of an Air Force picture here. Uh, but we do have engagements uh, across uh, all agencies, really, because we have not only the VA, IRS, the HS, the UJ, FBI, and the States, and command. I would almost say anybody but the Queen of England uh, working with us on Platform 1. But we also have the defense initial base uh, uh, literally betting on Platform 1. We have some of the big primes that announced they will be using Platform 1 for all of their DevSecOps or all of their work. Uh, really, no matter if it's uh, for an Air Force program or duty program, they're going to be using Platform 1 as uh, their um, DevSecOps uh, capability to build uh, innovation and, and capability. Uh, we have obviously engagements with uh, SNT and dozens of software factories and uh, program offices, including the largest programs on the planet. We have the A5, J, uh, Aegis, GPSC, ABMS, B21. So effectively really uh, providing uh, capability to anybody. Um, and a lot of the stuff we do is open source, and, and that, that I think is important for the adoption again. Um, Obviously, we have a map with people all over the, the world. That's great. Uh, across every type of mission, from the Space Force to uh, cyber offense, defense to, uh, uh, you know, jets and mobiles and, and, and whatever else, business systems. Uh, but some of the numbers, of, and that's not even the latest update. We just did a new update uh, yesterday, so I didn't have the chance to put it yet. Uh, but we have over 2,000 now um, developers, not users, but developers on Polybus. We have over 2,000 microservices built. And that's less than a year uh, on the Polybus. The Polybus is, uh, I mean, you heard what uh, Ken said about the, uh, what we do, but the, the Polybus is kind of this uh, multi-tenant DevSecOps environment. So developer can go and use it and, and create uh, a mission software and focus on that. So we have 2,000 microservices built on Polybus. We have uh, over 25 applications in production, 132 teams. Uh, building software capability on, on Platform 1. And Platform 1 is, is a one-year-old. Uh, we just had the one-year anniversary last week. Um, 314 containers on Iron Bank, um, and we do uh, 21 uh, commits of code per day, uh, under two days uh, for lead time to make changes, less than 15 minutes of time to restore when we have issues, uh, and under 5% change of uh, fader rate. So very great. Um, uh, Dora metrics for people that know what Dora me metrics are. Um, then I uh, wanted to cover a little bit of the Platform 1 services. We think of Platform 1 as a company providing services to the department. Uh, some of the services are free, uh, and so we can scale and bring some of the basics, and some are paper used so we can grow and scale. Repo 1 is the source of repo, uh, the source of truth of uh, all our automation, infrastructure as code, Kubernetes, distribution, source code of containers, uh, it's on Repo 1, and we have a new fancy domain now, so dso.mail, um, but dso.io still works, but we have dso.mail for people that uh, like the .mail uh, domains better, so Repo1.dso.mail. Uh, we have Iron Bank, which is the binary side of the containers. We have actually now 315 containers. We need to update these slides. Uh, 315 containers. We actually uh, crushed the, <laughs> the, the, the estimate of 250 containers by the end of 2020. Uh, we got uh, over 300. Um, and that's where you can pull these approved uh, um, open source and commercial uh, containers. Um, we have approved dozens of, oh, not dozens, but multiple uh, Kubernetes options, uh, Kubernetes distributions from Data2IQ, Rancher, OpenShift, uh, VMware, um, and looking at uh, cloud options as well. If you want to compare and you don't know which one to use, we have a, a, a comparison matrix that shows you uh, what options you have based on your need. Uh, if you need to run on real-time OS, if you need to run on different classification level, um, if, you, uh, if you're looking at different uh, type of metrics, uh, take a look at that matrix. Um, that can help you pick the right distribution for you guys. Um, and then we created two main uh, paid services. Uh, one is the... Um, Polybus, which is the multi-tenant uh, environment for ABMS, Jet C2. Uh, we are the official and only environment for ABMS. Um, we have multiple classification levels. Um, developers can just go and code and focus on coding. It comes with a DevSecOps pipeline and a full software factory with a country's ATO, um, and we provide it as a service. And then we have the Big Bang, 
And the Big Bang is a kind of uh, providing a platform one on demand anywhere. So that could be on a dedicated uh, cloud or separate cloud instance, uh, a dedicated environment uh, on premise or, or whatever the case may be. Uh, that gives us a lot of flexibility to instantiate uh, platform one anywhere at the edge on cloud providers or, or for bigger programs like F35 or GBSD that want to have a dedicated instance of platform one. Um, same thing, pay per use and consumption models for, for these two options. We also created the first uh, ever, uh, in fact, when I started in DoD, people told me that would never be even possible. Uh, but we created the Cloud Native Access Point, which is moving away from the IAP and the CAP uh, to make them a cloud agnostic, elastic, and um, um, use zero trust uh, as an enforcement mechanism. Effectively, that provides access to uh, Amazon and Azure and soon Nipper and Tipper um, to connect to Impact Level 2.5 and use a zero trust enforcement uh, meaning we check the device state and the, based on the user identity and the state of the device that he's using or she's using. Uh, if it's a v, if it's a thick endpoint or mobile endpoint, we also have VDI options, uh, both training on device, government owned, contractor owned devices, and based on the state of the device, allow access to different resources using single sign on. So that's a, that's a zero trust ingress back to the cloud or to the on-premise environment to enforce zero trust based on need to know and based on the device state and the security of the device. Um, then obviously training is, is foundational. One of the key aspects to uh, really keep up uh, with the pace of relevance is to enable your teams to do continuous uh, learning. Uh, we give an hour a day to our people at platform one to learn. Uh, continuously so they can um, stay ahead or at least not get behind. Uh, so we have workshops that uh, people can attend one day, three days. And we even do uh, a two months full uh, minimum viable product where we partner, we invite people into the program office and their uh, contractors to uh, get them to move to DevSecOps and come up with the first uh, minimum viable product. Um, of course, none of this would make any sense if you cannot uh, buy and uh, buy cloud services and licenses and talents, um, both uh, in terms of DevSecOps, DevOps, Scrum Masters, uh, Site Reliability Engineers, or whatever it is you need. Uh, so we created the DevSecOps Basic Ordering Agreement, the BOAS, that are designed with uh, you know dozens of companies now on contract. Uh, for cloud services, uh, licenses, for tools, and talent. So programs can come to us and use those vehicles to uh, buy all of what they need to instantiate uh, devs like ops enclaves. Um, I saw that the Ken kind of covered some of these layers. And again, this is back to inheritance and being able to swap layers to accredit things and be more efficient and be agnostic and be able to deploy your software at multiple classification levels or multiple locations. Uh, we separate the infrastructure layer, which could be a cloud on-premise or a jet or a bomb or whatever. Uh, we add the platform Kubernetes stack. We add your uh, software factory, continuous integration, continuous delivery layer on top, which is fully containerized. We bring a service mesh, which um, is enforcing zero trust for your traffic between containers, we call that the east and west traffic between containers. And then what's, like um, uh, Ken was saying, what's inherited at the application layer is massive. Um, we estimate about 90% of the rest, the 853 controls are inherited by inheriting both the uh, service mesh layer of the platform layer and the uh, side cloud container security stack, which enforces um, zero trust, um, does behavior detection and continuous monitoring capabilities in runtime, but also uh, centralized logs and telemetry for monitoring as well. Um, if you look at the complexity of the DevSecOps pipelines, you have all these uh, moving pieces, uh, different options. And that's just an example. We have uh, hundreds of uh, tools on Iron Bank now. Uh, so, you know, when you look at um, all these options, if you were to run these at multiple classification levels, and uh, for dev, test, staging, and prod, 
you end up with a lot of environments to manage. If you were not to use containers or not to use what we do, uh, you end up having drifts uh, between environments and you would start getting behind and drifting and uh, having a cyber risk uh, and a larger attack surface as well. And by using containers, they self-update, self-heal, and we can make sure we have a complete automation between the classification levels and the environments. Um, so people ask me, you know, why why did we pick uh, did we pick uh, Kubernetes and containers? Well, first we talked about the uh, vendor locking aspect of avoiding avoiding that um, containers are immutable. Uh, we can centrally accredit containers, and the good news is compared to a VM. The container image can be used on any any platform, any environment. So effectively, we don't have to create different images per cloud or per on-premise environment. So we can really harden uh, a container and make that available uh, for consumption across DoD. And then we uh, provide, um, uh, by using Kubernetes, we provide resiliency because containers are self-healing. So they uh, automatically restore when they crash. Um, they the concept of a sidecar container that uh, brings a, a tremendous value. A lot of people don't understand it, unfortunately, but uh, a sidecar is a small container running alongside your uh, mission uh, software uh, containers, and it can be injected across the stack. So effectively, you can inject cyber products, you can inject behavior, or whatever it is you want to do as a sidecar, which decouples that the sidecar from the, the rest of the software, so you can update it separately, uh, so if there's a big new cyber uh, event, we can update our cyber stack without having to update our uh, applications. And so that, that creates a lot of flexibility. And then, of course, um, uh, we are adapt adaptable because containers are Lego blocks that can be swapped with no downtime thanks to uh, modern routing. And uh, we use the concept of infrastructure as code and GitOps to be fully automated with a push button deployment so we can instantiate the stack anywhere. Um, everything is auto scaling, so um, the more load of compute or memory needs you have, Kubernetes is going to scale up and down based on need. Um, and of course, like I said, we're abstracted from the cloud APIs. Um, and for us, if you have code, gives us that ability to instantiate the stack anywhere with a push button deployment, so everything is encoded, it's immutable, it's replicable, it's automated, um, uh, it removes human in production and reduces the attack surface uh, and insider threat risk. Uh, and GitOps is kind of the evolution of that, which brings that single source of truth and everything is code and uh, compliance and auditability is facilitated because everything is in, in Git and you can see your desired state. And you can do consistent deployments and rollback if you have issues, but also it enforces your change management enforcement by uh, having multiple eyes on code. So to approve a change, uh, you have to go through uh, multiple approver, one, two, three, four, whatever the number you decide to make sure that the, the change is approved and that becomes your desired state and your source of truth, facilitating your disaster recovery because if you have an issue, all you have to back up is your source code repo and your databases. Um, Kubernetes for us pulls from Git. It's not like uh, some others that have a CI/CD pipeline that pushes into production, uh, having keys of the production system, uh, which is a big security issue. In our case, um, Kubernetes uh, doesn't need to have ports open. Uh, it pulls from Git every minute uh, to be able to see if there is a change to apply. That removes human from production environments, and you don't need to have people that SSH into the stack. Um, um, we use Argo CD and Flux uh, for that. Um, and I see that there are questions about digital UI. I'll be answering that. I'll be pointing you to the right people. Um, but um, quickly, I have two more slides i like to cover uh, about the Compute ATO. So as part of my work and the, the teams, the number six in the DSOG DevSecOps team, we created this um, guidance um, that will become uh, the one in, in the Air Force, all software teams, um, to accredit uh, things using a continuous ATO. Three pillars to that is uh, authorizing the platform, uh, authorizing the process, and the team. 
both the team that ran the platform and the team that uh, used the platform to create software. Um, like I said, three gates, three pillars. Um, the platform, of course, is a software factory. If you use Platform 1 or Black Pearl, you comply on day one uh, with those requirements, which is awesome. You have to use the hardened containers from Iron Bank, and you have to be compliant with the duty enterprise that's like up preference design, which obviously we are. Um, and we use, of course, the spike of the security stack. So all that is checked day one if you use either Platform 1 or Black Pearl. And then, of course, uh, when it comes to the process, we look at the gates inside the CICD pipeline. So we have kind of three main gates. One is the change management gate. The second one is the testing gates. And the third one is the cyber gates. Change management gates, we define how many set of eyes you need to make a change based on the criticality of that change. You can have different set of eyes based on the kind of change. If it's a change on your platform or your service mesh or your applications, uh, on your infrastructure as code, we can define a number of eyes that needs to approve that change. So that gives you kind of a change management baked in into your Git repo. And then we have testing gates for unit testing, integration testing, end-to-end -end testing. And finally, we have uh, uh, server gates with uh, static dynamic analysis, container security scanning, a bit of material scanning for uh, your dependencies of dependencies. And uh, we work with your AO to define the thresholds of these gates. Uh, and if you pass the gates, then you pass the uh, certificate to field. And then, of course, we uh, have to train the team that runs the platform and the team that builds software and creates software using the platform. And there's a whole training on that, uh, on the DevSecOps culture and how to measure the metrics and also all the cyber requirements inside of Thread and checking clearances and all that good stuff. Uh, effectively, we're moving away from a snapshot in time uh, to uh, uh, real-time, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, real-time risk management uh, with dashboards and uh, uh, CI/CD that uh, uh, have a risk uh, threshold trigger to be able to uh, involve maybe the ISSM or the AO uh, based on the criticality of the finding uh, and to pass the pipeline if it passes the pipeline. Um, effectively creating this uh, repeatable, secure uh, uh, application uh, uh, platform uh, that can be instantiated anywhere uh, on any environment. Um, again, wanted to point out again some of the uh, links. Uh, there's a video of uh, me talking a little bit more about uh, all of these subjects uh, on the software.af.mail slash DSOP slash documents uh, page. Uh, where you can learn about Confuse ATO. There's a whole two-hour session on Confuse ATO. Um, there's a whole video on Platform One and a lot of training content. If you're learning uh, Service Mesh, Kubernetes, Containers, go on the training page. You're going to find a lot of great content there. And if you need to check out our source code, you go to Rapid One, you go to Iron Bank, you go to Registry One. Um, if you want to learn more about what we're doing with uh, uh, embedded uh, software, and real-time OS, you can check out DevStar uh, there and reach out to us at any time. And, and here's the email for you to connect with us if you want to be uh, put in touch with uh, Platform One or um, Black Pearl or anybody in my office or me, uh, shoot us an email. And uh, thanks for the time, and we'll take uh, questions, I guess, now. Hi there. This is Lindsay. Uh I am going to help facilitate the question, the Q&A. In one moment. The first question is for Mr. Cato. You did answer some of these in the chat, but we want to make sure that everyone heard them. So I'm going to read them here too. In the code base for Black Pearl, is, is the code for Black Pearl exclusively open source? Uh, it is. And right now we are deciding on what open source license that best protects the government's interests, wants, and needs going forward. And they will also simultaneously enable us to host that as publicly facing as possible to the greatest of audience. So we're, we're going to chop with different lawyers and stuff to figure out what that looks like. As soon as it gets up, we'll hopefully have an exciting announcement for you all soon. 
Yeah, and w- one thing I, I like to add on that, um, obviously, open source doesn't mean um, open governance, right? Um, we we are obviously releasing. Uh, sorry, there's an echo. Sorry, I don't know who is unmuted. Uh, but uh, we're releasing the software open source. Ninety nine percent of it, at least, is open source. Doesn't mean obviously anyone can just come and make changes. Uh, we certainly have a tight control and an approval process on, on reviewing the merge request and making sure that uh, not anyone can just come and make changes. Just to clarify, I know some people are not used to open source engagements in DoD. Uh, so while we are open sourcing uh, all of the platform one work, we doesn't we don't give away control. I wanted to clarify that. All right, thank you so much. Uh, next question is also from Mr. Cato. Often today, DevOps practitioners misapply DevOps by completely bypassing the design process. How do we bring back the value of design in software design? I couldn't agree more where a lot of folks are so caught up in the idea of going fast that we forget the first step. So for us, we have a specific process of discovery and training that's led by designers to help us understand what products and projects have the highest value in the nearest term to work on. So within Black Pearl, we like to practice a specific design-led discovery and training process to help facilitate designers to have that opinion first and then to teach that same idea to different programs we work with. There are three questions in the beginning. Um, the next one is, how do you see industry contributing to Black Pearl? You know what, while he comes back, I might answer the question for, for him a little bit. Uh, and obviously, I, I'll type this back to, to Platform One. Uh, you know, we don't believe there's any chance of success. Uh, so, I oh, you're feel back. that in order for us right. to have the same kind of a purchase with us, also working with vendors, I there's got to be some way to do that. And the more I thought it through, there are existing certification products for companies like ISO certification that help provide not just the Department of Defense, the government as a whole, some kind of assurance that folks are coming in qualified to do things well to work with us in an open source fashion where people understand what that means. Hopefully that's your question. Yeah, and Ken, you're, you're breaking up a little bit, just so you know. Uh, you, it seems like your connection is not great. Maybe you want to dial in. I don't know. Uh, but let me add a little bit to that. Sorry. Yeah, it's a little bit better now, although you're still a little bit uh, lagging. But um, um, what I, I'm just going to add to what you said, right, is um, we, we know that uh, there is no chance of success for the departments if we don't bring the large industry. And I don't just mean the dead, but I mean everybody. Uh, alongside uh, of the work we're doing. And we really want to open source um, this work as a real open source project. And we have dozens of organizations that are, have no tie to DOD, both in healthcare and finance, um, that are engaged to participate. But we also have countless um, dev organizations working with us to contribute into uh, Rapo one So the easiest way for anyone to contribute is to Look at the, the code and, and start uh, pushing merge requests and uh, help us solve some issues. And of course, you can uh, bid on, on some of the work we're, we're putting on the, the BOAs. Uh, you can also push containers to Iron Bank. There's a container onboarding guide on the software that they have that mail website slash DSOP slash documents where you can find how to uh, push your software as a product to Iron Bank so it can be used by DOD, and we are created DOD by all the way to staff. So it's a great value for companies to, to do that. And then of course, we need to buy your license and, and whatever to, to use it. So um, hopefully that, that helps. Okay, and, um, Mr. Shalon, the next question is for you. Is the zero trust architecture provided by SDSS portable across domains or mainly Air Force specific? No, that's a great question. The, the, the zero trust stack is, is really designed for anything. So we, in fact, it's actually being used by 
Free uh, DoD organization <clears throat> because we we are providing platform one access to the Navy, the Army, uh, the Fourth State, uh, NSA, and Zero Command. So effectively, uh, the Zero Trust stack uh, is designed to be agnostic. It's also designed to work uh, air gapped uh, if needed. Uh, so it is something that we can run on classified environments. It's also cloud agnostic and elastic, uh, so it can uh, run on premise, but it also runs on Amazon and Azure right now. Uh, but it also can be social on nipper and zipper and higher classification as well. Thank you. And the next question, um, Mr. Cato, from your point of view, are formal methods something that you see supporting DevSecOps, especially for cyber physical systems? in the short and medium term? So when the framing of four methods mentioned, can I get some clarity what that is meant? Well, I'll wait for someone to respond in the chat. If you don't mind, I'll just jump to the next question while we wait. Is that okay? And the next one's for both of you. Are you exploring the binary optimization and enhancement of performance for edge, and in parentheses, constrained devices, and in parentheses, deployment? I can, I can start, I guess, if you want. Um, yeah, we, we do have a few products already on Iron Bank that enables uh, binary optimization. Obviously, battery optimization and enhancement can be a lot of different things, um, but there are a few products that we have on Iron Bank right now that allow you to both do optimization, but also some do some scrambling uh, to try to uh, mitigate attack vectors like run safe and others. Um, so I, I know we have options now, of course. The question is how many people actually use it uh, in actual production? I, I, I don't know if it's widely used. It's, it's mostly something that... Uh, was added in the last six months. Uh, it's, it's about maturity now of the, the teams to start consuming some of these capabilities, but they are available. So I guess we did the first piece of the puzzle here. So to add on to Nick, uh, we do value very much uh, as computing and specific optimization, recognizing that there are some certain installations and environments where a large-scale platform and tooling may not be appropriate. So we do have our opinions on what that should look like for specific naval operations and missions, but they're highly specific and bespoke. Okay, and then returning to the last question, for clarity, we received tools like model testing. So to repeat the question, from your point of view, are formal methods something that you see supporting DevSecOps, especially for cyber physical systems, in the short and medium term, tools like model testing? I'm happy to touch on that. So we have our own tooling set that evaluates a couple of things. So one tool set is designed to run a CI job to evaluate whether or not your code base does what it should be doing, and B, whether or not it's introducing any vulnerabilities would be unacceptable within the government. We also have a separate security tool set that looks at the platform along with the adversary team to do checking of both. So we do the expected CI tooling that you see many organizations leverage today across industry. But we also take advantage of adversary testing to ensure that there are some humans wandering, kind of the, the weird, like, you know, blind person people do it and how we make inference of that may be outside of traditional tool checking that we find of high value. Uh, thank you. Another question we have is for both of you. And it is, how are sandbox development and testing facilitated prior to deployment into production on platform one? Are sandbox options provided? We, we provide sandbox option staging, and um, we obviously have a way to instantiate the stack to test it as well. So I, I hope that answers the question. Okay. 
Wonderful. And I have one more here. Maybe another one. It appears, I believe that this is for you, Mr. Shalon. It is the following. It appears that your approval process depends a lot on the human role. Is there any effort to automate some of that process? Well, you know, I think there's always going to be some human component to the uh, to the DevSecOps world because um, you obviously need to make sure that not one person can trigger uh, completely automatically a change uh, that could be malicious in nature while passing uh, the cybersecurity scan than the test, effectively similar to what we've seen with solar winds, where uh, someone gets into the CICD pipeline and inject not not bad code but malicious code in nature. So they they will always uh, need to be uh, a need of having multiple set of eyes on, on code change like merge requests. Uh, but it's not like the old school change board management stack that used to uh, meet every three weeks and take. Uh, months to approve stuff. We're talking about something that can be approved within a minute uh, just by having someone take a look at the code change and approve it. Ideally, the change is small. It's iterative, so it's not a big uh, lift to go and review the change. The the goal is to make sure we need to get inside a threat or malicious actors that manage to get into the pipeline somehow by hijacking maybe an account or part of the development team members. Um, and also, you know, you need to make sure that uh, the need to know at least privilege and uh, uh, those key cyber principles are enforced. Um, and so there is a need to, to have uh, human verification. And, and while we are highly automating a lot of the uh, testing, unit testing, integration testing, end-to-end testing, uh, I would argue that uh, for nuclear systems and uh, critical uh, airworthiness components of the jet, and stuff like that, we, we still welcome the ability of humans to do additional testing. The, the goal is to stay away from what we used to do, which was really doing basic um, testing of unit testing and stuff like that, uh, and instead really use human where they should be used, which is the more advanced end-to-end testing and, and trying to find mistakes that uh, uh, the, the automation was not able to detect. Um, so obviously we highly, highly automate everything from the merge request to all the way to the deployment of the software. So the bottleneck is, is very small, but it is still needed for, uh, surety and, uh, inside of threat mitigation. Thank you for that. It does appear that I have one more question for Mr. Lawn. Who would be the right contact for industry to discuss potential contribution to Platform One? Uh, they should reach out to the to the AF.TSO. I'm, I'm going to put on the chat again, uh, email, and we'll we'll make the introduction uh, to the right person based on the the contribution. Just for a little bit of detail of what you're thinking about and what you're trying to help with and. We'll we'll make the right introduction to the right person. Okay. And I have another one that I may have inadvertently missed. Um, let's see. PMI, is there are any licensing requirements to use your solution code bases in healthcare or education settings? So uh, I briefly answered on the chat here, and uh, this is something I'd love to ask you ask. Uh, as a President's Innovation Fellow, I actually asked this question to other government agents that are non-defense, simply to challenge the notion, why can't we? So a great question. Uh, there isn't a good answer why you can or can't. Honestly, it's going to come down to, in your, in your agency, talking to your AO and what they will or will not accept for risk. That's what's going to come down to is that conversation. And it's a really important one to have, and one that both Nick and I have had in our respective services to try to break down that barrier to make technology adoption easier. Yeah, and, and to add to that, right, we, we have engagements with um, at least 14 .gov agencies uh, directly at the CIO level. Many of them are looking at uh, drafting memos to have full reciprocity 
with everything we're doing, I would argue if it's good enough for weapons systems, any glass systems, and jetfire memorials, and space systems, it's probably good enough for pretty much anybody. But um, I also know that we have uh, dozens of organizations on the financial side, healthcare, that are using a lot of what we do because being compliant with the NIST, the cybersecurity framework, we are often also compliant with HIPAA and other um, requirements that uh, those organizations have to deal with uh, in terms of uh, a cybersecurity or compliance requirements. So I, I really don't see why not. Uh, but again, I always also welcome the ability to set up uh, discussions to go over uh, concerns with their leadership. So if you have a CIO, a CISO, an AO that is um, giving you a tough time uh, in terms of using any of the stuff we talked about today, uh, that's where you call me. Thank you so much. And I just want to make a note uh, for participants that Mr. Shalon also provided a contact email in the chat, and uh, we're happy to provide it if you can't see the chat for some reason and you want you to follow up with us afterwards. And that actually concludes the questions, and so I'm going to pass it back to Ms. Callie King. All right. Thank you, Lindsay, and thank you, Mr. Cato and Mr. Shalon. Um, we very much enjoyed the presentation today. Uh, that's going to conclude Innovation Connect. Our next Innovation Connect is scheduled for the 8th of February, and we're excited about that one, too. Our speakers are going to be the chief data officers of all three major agencies, um, Ms. Eileen Vadreen from the Department of the Air Force, uh, Mr. Tom Sasala from the Department of the Navy, and Dr. David Markowitz from the Army. So we look forward to uh, hearing about innovation and data with them next month. Uh, videos of this event and other Innovation Connects are all going to be published on our YouTube page, the Chief Data Office YouTube page. And uh, let's see, we, we encourage everyone to follow us on Twitter and LinkedIn as well. We update uh, whenever we have new presentations coming out and any kind of speaking engagements as well. Um, and keep up with all the events that we have going on. If you have any questions, you can reach out to myself. I am Callie King, and I am going to enter my email here in the chat as well. Um, and if you have any suggestions for topics you'd like to see presented at Innovation Connect, I'd love to hear from you on that also. Uh, thank you for taking the time to attend today's program, and we look forward to seeing you next month. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thank you.